There's no doubt we're at the next stage of the property cycle, what many people call the slump phase of the cycle. What some don't understand is that not all property prices are slumping. So today we talk about which type of properties are going to outperform in a buyer's market. I'm going to share a mindset message with you from one of my mentors, Jim Rowan. And then I'm going to have a chat about what the common investment goals the team at Metropole see are, what beginners investors look for, what more experienced investors look for, so that you can understand where you fit in and whether maybe you should step up to the mark. So welcome to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's most trusted property commentator, who has once again been voted our leading expert in wealth creation. That's the fifth time he's won a similar award in the last seven years. Are you wondering what's going on with the property market? whether you should buy, whether you should sell, how your property portfolio is performing. Well, welcome to the club, because there are so many mixed messages out there in the media, even on the same day, the same newspapers, the same internet blogs have (laughs) contradictory messages. So no wonder you're confused. But look, there's no doubt about it. We've moved to the next stage of the property cycle and a period of softer growth in some areas and further falling prices in other areas. So what should you do as a property investor and which type of properties are going to hold their own in this market? That's what I'm going to discuss with you in just a moment as I look back at previous cycles and our research to explain to you which properties perform better in a buyer's market. And some do, and you better know which they are. I'm also going to share with you a mentorship lesson I learned from one of my mentors, Jim Rowan. And then we're going to have a chat with Ahmed Imam, Director of Metropole in Sydney, and have a chat about what investors are looking for for their financial goals. And it's really interesting. Beginning investors all seem to have much the same aims, the same end game that they're aiming at, while sophisticated investors in general, have very, very different aims. Let's unpack that and see where you fit in and maybe how you could think differently. So welcome to this week's show again, and let's get on with the show. Well, we've clearly moved to the next phase of the property cycle from those dizzying days when property values went up so much you could buy a property, go away on holidays, come back a couple of weeks later and you'd made money in, particularly the Melbourne, Sydney and probably even the Hobart property market. So from the hot seller's market of a few years ago, we're now into a buyer's market where there are more properties for sale, particularly in the Melbourne and Sydney market than there are buyers. And so people are becoming a little bit nervous and buyers are holding back their purchasing decision. We're now in what's called a buyer's market. We're homeowners, we're investors. Now have got the balance of power on their side. Now, that's a good thing. But the common question I'm asked are, should you buy now? Should you wait? Are prices going to drop further? How much are they going to drop if they're going to drop further? And how long is all this going to last? And which properties are more likely to suffer and which will hold their own in a buyer's market? And that's really what we're going to have a bit of a chat about now. So let's start with what's happening to property values around Australia. We're experiencing a soft landing. The latest figures from CoreLogic suggest that the Melbourne market's dropped around 3% and the Sydney market about 6% in the last 12 months, but that's off 70-80% capital growth in Sydney, and in some areas much more than that over the last five years, and Melbourne having over 50% capital growth. Melbourne's market started falling in November last year, Sydney in the middle of 2017. So Sydney's about six months ahead of Melbourne, but they're both experiencing a soft landing. Interestingly, no faster falls in prices than in previous downturns, in fact, lower falls. Now, most people have forgotten we've had three downturns in the last decade, including this one. There's currently the 
downturn we're talking about. There was one in 2010-12 related to interest rate rises. And there was one in 2009, again, related to some interest rate rises. And interestingly, both times we had a downturn in the last decade, the other times, the Reserve Bank lowered interest rates. The government stepped in with incentives to make sure property prices didn't fall too far. And that's likely to happen again if we have any significant downturn, but I can't see that happening, and I'll explain why in a moment. So going around Australia, some of the markets are still doing well. Brisbane market's picking up, Hobart market's doing okay, Adelaide market, Canberra market is still doing okay. But remember, there's not one property market. There's multiple markets, even within Sydney, even within Melbourne. So there are areas in each of those big capital cities where overall prices are falling, the values are still holding. So we've got to work out where and what those locations are. So we're experiencing a mild downturn, and this is normal. Every boom is followed by this downturn phase, which sets smart investors and good home buyers up for the next upturn. What's ahead is the other big question people are asking. And you'd have to be living under a rock not to know there's an election coming up next year, and that's making people nervous. In particular, investors are nervous that the odds are shortening for a shortened government. What does that mean for property investors? Well, currently, you know that they're talking about fiddling with capital gains tax and removing negative gearing on existing properties. But they've clearly said that if they do bring this in, they're not going to do this retrospectively. In other words, anyone who's already bought a property before that date, and the date may not be straight away when they come into power, it's very likely they're going to wait uh, for a while to see how the market's going. But if they do bring in those changes and you're worried about that, the answer is get in now. Because if you do, during this buyer's market, you'll be grandfathered and you won't uh, have the issues about negative gearing. You'll still be able to Claim that. But having said that, as I've said often, negative gearing is not a property strategy. That's not a reason to buy or not to buy a property. But if that's what's holding you back, then please move forward. So I see some investor nervousness, but I think that's a good time to buy counter-cyclically. Look, neither side of politics wants a property crash. It's likely that the Labor government wants prices to slip a little to be seen to be helping housing affordability. But think about it. All those people who eventually buy into the market, if prices slip a bit, they don't want property values to drop further once they're bought in, once they've found affordable housing. They want property values to go up. So what would happen if property values dropped a bit? As I said a bit earlier, it's been shown in the past. The banking system, the government doesn't want property values to slump. They're happy for them to have a soft landing. So if there is signs of a bigger downturn, The Reserve Bank has got the capacity to lower interest rates. They could easily lower them a quarter or a half percent. And if they do, as has always happened in the past, it will instill confidence and the market will pick up again. Similarly, APRA, who said they're not going to tighten the screws anymore, can loosen the screws more. So there's a number of pillars supporting our property markets. And of course, so state governments and federal governments really can help the property markets by giving first homeowner grants or stamp duty relief. That's what they've done in the past. So it's not Armageddon, as some of the TV shows have said. So next year will be a quieter phase, and I still see property values slipping in Melbourne and Sydney overall, probably about another 4 or 5% in both those capital cities, but some properties are going to hold their own. Again, we'll talk about which in just a moment. Interestingly, the ANZ Bank recently brought out some forecasts suggesting much the same and believing that 2019 is the year things are going to turn. It'll be a year of transition and 2020, the market's going to turn up again. In fact, there's already some signs with uh, one of ANZ Bank's indicators of uh, property searches, more people searching for property or property-related terms, that there's interest in property again. So what's going to happen next will really depend upon the availability of finance and consumer confidence. As I said, if finance is going to be too tight and it's going to stifle and choke the market, there's lots of opportunities for regulators and banks and the government to underpin our property markets. Because what's really, really underpinning them in the long term, of course, is our strong economy, strong population growth, 
jobs growth, we're currently not getting wages growth. So areas where wages growth is low means it's unlikely for property values to increase much, but there are still some suburbs, some locations, some industries where wages are going up more, and that's what's likely to allow some property values to hold their own and still keep going up. I think over the next 12 months, uh, the Perth property market may finally bottom after four years of falling prices, but its recovery is going to be slow and unlikely to start increasing for another couple of years. So don't don't rush into the Perth property market to buy counter-cyclically. And Hobart's strong growth is likely to slow down over the next year. I think Brisbane is going to be the most Uh, attractive market for investors with the highest capital growth but again you've got to be very selective only certain suburbs in Brisbane is where I'd be investing and Canberra will do okay as well so people are then saying to me well Michael if I'm looking to get into property should I buy now or should I wait because you just told me property prices are going to drop a bit further Again, as I said, while the property markets have weakened, the supply of good properties has also decreased. In other words, there are fewer what I'd call A-grade homes on the market, and there are clearly fewer investment-grade properties on the market. And because of that, the old supply and demand equation means that even in the weak Melbourne and Sydney property markets, some properties are holding their values well, and in some municipalities, some suburbs, prices are still going up. So my message to you is rather than trying to time the market, if you're a home buyer, your family needs should really dictate when you buy your next property. In fact, if you're a first home buyer, take advantage of the bank's current willingness to lend you money, as long as you can afford it, of course, and the banks are being more careful about that. And if you're an established home buyer, in my mind, this is a perfect time for you to trade up your home. I know your property would be worth a little bit less today. Your current home is probably worth less than it was five months ago, a year or two ago. But so will the property that you're buying, that you're upgrading. So this is the perfect market to upgrade your home. On the other hand, if you're an investor, the right time to get into the market is when you've got the finance ability to do so and it fits in with your long-term goals. As I said, we had a downturn in 2010 to 12 and in 2008 and 9 and I was investing through that and a lot of our clients at Metropole were, and they were investing when other people said, oh, the market's still going to take a year to turn. Gee, the property market's going to drop another 5 6%. And look what's happened to property value since. Those investors are very, very happy. So my message is don't try and time the market. Think about it. This is the first time in years we've experienced a buyer's market. Well, in Sydney and Melbourne anyway. But that hasn't changed our long-term outlook. The fundamentals, as I said, of strong population growth, a robust economy, excellent jobs creation, state government infrastructure spending, that's what's going to underpin our markets and our economy. So back to one of my earlier questions. What segments of the property market are likely to suffer most over the next little while? And fortunately, we can get some lessons from the past. Each quarter... CoreLogic releases its pain and gain report, and that gives us insights into which type of properties have been resold at a profit. So what they see is what prices were purchased at and what they've been resold at. And not surprisingly, the vast majority, almost 90% of properties in Australia, delivered their owners a profit when they sold. Now, some trends emerged as I read into the statistics. Around 10% of all properties sold were sold at a loss, because as I said, 90% were sold as a profit. Now, some of those that were sold at a profit, once you took into account maybe uh, holding costs, interest rates, stamp duty, they didn't make much of a profit at all. Another trend is that apartments were more likely to sell at a loss than houses. Why? Well, I think it's because a lot of the investors bought apartments and got out soon, and they paid a premium, they paid a high price, they bought off the plan or new properties that were never worth what they paid for them. CoreLogic also reports that in the last quarter, Melbourne units were 10 times more likely to resell at a loss than houses. It was much the same in Brisbane, where in Brisbane, units, apartments, were more likely to sell, nine times more likely to sell at a loss than houses, and in Canberra, it was eight times more. Interestingly, the greater proportion of units resold for a profit than houses in Sydney and Hobart over the last quarter. Not surprisingly, regional properties tended to sell at a loss 
more than capital city properties. Now, I know in the last little while, regional properties have held their own, but the more recent statistics are showing that those markets, regional markets, are suffering more now. They're catching up with the downturn. Again, I want to invest in areas that are underpinned by multiple pillars of the economy, which doesn't really happen in regional markets. And even though there is some economic growth and jobs growth in some regional markets, in general, they tend to be more transient, more casual jobs. Don't fight the trends invest in the big capital cities. Now, there's nothing new what I've said about these statistics from the CoreLogic Pain and Gain report. I've said it often before, but it's worth repeating. Avoid off-the-plan properties because on completion, a large proportion of these units value in at considerably below the contract price what you paid. And I'd also avoid locations where residents are more likely to suffer from mortgage stress. So that'll be the young family areas in the outer suburbs where beginning investors and home buyers, particularly home buyers, have stretched their finances. So we're trying to work out which segments of the market are going to underperform, perform the worst in the next little while. So I'd be steering clear of those, as well as uh, the the many property spruikers currently coming out in the market disguised as investment advisors who are actually working for project marketers, working for developers, because they're luring naive investors into get-rich-quick schemes. How to you know, buy seven properties in seven minutes, it doesn't work that way. Remember Warren Buffett's beautiful saying, wealth is the transfer of money from the impatient to the patient. So which properties are going to hold their own? It's really going to be in areas where wages are still going up, where affordability is going up because people's wages are improving and they've got higher disposable income. They tend to be the more affluent suburbs of our big capital cities. So what does this mean for you if you're looking to move forward? The key to property success hasn't changed. It's to buy well-located properties because the location is going to do most of the heavy lifting of the performance of your property. And while there are still many buyers in the market, what this has meant is that being more careful, there's what I call a flight to quality. Purchases are bypassing secondary properties. Now, that's making certain properties cheaper, but don't get lured into buying a bargain. Cheap in now will always be cheap. I came across the daughter of a friend who asked me some advice over the weekend, and she found this cheap property on a main road right next door, right near a big intersection. And she said, oh, I can get it really cheaply. And I said, I know you can, because it's so hard to get in and out in the morning. Yeah, people live everywhere. They do live on main roads. They do live in some of these unpleasant buildings. But having said that, Look how long it's been sitting on the market. Look why the vendor has had to discount it. That's not an investment-grade property. Now, she wasn't buying it for an investment. She was buying it as an emotional first home buyer and got lured by a cheap price. But that's a one-off bonus. I'd rather buy the sort of property that's going to do well in the long term because of its location. And that's related to lifestyle, uh, located to amenity. It's affected by uh, good public transport. So... As you know, getting around our big cities in the future is not going to get any easier. And people are going to pay a premium to live in walkable locations and near public transports. This is all the things that are going to make certain properties outperform over the next year. And I believe it's the right time over the next year to get into the market, to get set for the upturn. So don't buy a cheap property because as the market improves, the better properties are the ones that are going to outperform. So... Maybe I should just finish this segment by saying, don't try and be smart. Don't try and time the market. Even the experts can't time the market. And don't rush in. Don't buy an emotional purchase. Instead, do careful research. Not just online research. You've got to pound the pavement. You've got to get to know local prices. You've got to understand what's happening in the local market, how it's behaving, and make sure you don't overpay. This is an opportunity not to chase prices like with fear of missing out like you did in the booming times. Take advantage of the flatter market. Now, more than ever, though, it's a really important time to get a good team around you, including a proficient mortgage broker to help you through the maze of finance and the banks. And I believe a property strategist and a buyer's agent to help level the playing field when you're in the thick of things against the agents. 
What about buying at auction at the moment? Auction clearance rates are low and there's less competition. I'd be prepared to buy at auction, but be careful. Now, i found currently agents are trying to convince buyers to make pre-auction offers because sometimes they've only got one buyer, you, there. And they don't want to go to an auction with only one buyer because that doesn't create an auction and it gets passed in. So they try and convince you to make an offer before auction. I understand why some potential buyers may see this offer of making a pre-auction offer and it's an opportunity. They say, oh, I'm not going to have competition on auction day. But sometimes there is no competition. You're shadow boxing, so you're overpaying because there wouldn't have been anyone to compete with on auction day. This is hard. It's hard to get the upper hand when you've got these good negotiators, these agents working for the vendor. Again, that's why I'd be suggesting having a proficient buyer's agent on your side to protect you. Because if there was another buyer there to compete, generally the agent would be happy to take the property to auction. Again, I've got no issue with buying an auction. I think it's a very transparent way of doing things. And we know that vendors are a bit nervous and they're accepting good fair prices today. They're not being overly optimistic on what they're going to get. I guess the other tip I'd make is once you buy a property, don't compulsively follow property prices online. This is only going to end up with buyer's remorse. Instead, be reassured that if you've done the right work, the homework, and you've bought the right property, the long-term fundamentals are going to support our markets and increase the value of your property. So if you're considering investing or buying a new home, Take advantage of the buyer's market. While experienced investors love these markets because they've got more time to make decisions, they can negotiate more effectively, it seems that a lot of beginning investors, they find it hard to either decide to buy or not. And why is this? Oh, look, I guess one of the reasons is in a seller's market, uh, like we had a while ago where, where the market was booming, less experienced investors gain comfort because they think everybody else is buying, getting in, so I've got to do the same. So it's much easier. You feel you've made a good decision if you're doing what everyone else is doing. But when it comes to making a decision to buy in one of these softer markets, we seem to have the notion, well, I guess everyone else knows something I don't know. They're not doing something, so I shouldn't do it either. I've found when all the news in the media is good, and breeds content, you know, makes people happy, assured, they're comfortable making decisions to buy homes, make investments, buy cars, make big in, uh, outlays. So in booming times, in good times, everyone's comfortable. However, at times of uncertainty, or when we get bad news or mixed messages in the press, this doesn't breed happy people, it breeds unhappy people. One thing's certain, we can't accurately predict the peaks and troughs in the market. Sure, we can sit on the sidelines and wait until the market starts rising again and then compete with a new herd of confident buyers. But that group of investors is always going to pay more than those who are looking for good deals in today's current quieter buyer's market. So the bottom line is, it's only going to be a buyer's market for you if you buy. And as an investor, you need to take a long-term view. Do your homework, research carefully, Make sure you don't overpay. And now go out and buy that property today that you would have had to fight for a year or so ago, that you would have had to pay more for a year or so ago. And then when you listen to my words next year and the year after, you'll think, gee, I made a good decision. And if you're still unsure and you need somebody to hold your hand, why not have a chat with the team at Metropole? Because remember, we've got no properties for sale, so we're there to represent you, the buyer. One of the things we may just do is, after you've had a chat with us, give you one of my books. That may be all that you need. Or you, you may sit down and have a property strategic plan written, which will give you some guidelines. Or you may just have your current portfolio reviewed. Or if you want to, you may end up having our buyer's agents represent you, help you, help you do the research, help negotiate. Whatever, give us a call at Metropole, one uh, metropole or go to metropole.com.au. We're coming up for a short break, but stick around because I'm going to be back with a mindset message from Jim Rowan, one of my mentors, and then I have a chat with Ahmed Imam, Director of Metropole in Sydney, to talk about what the common goals are for the property investors he and his team see, and it'll be interesting for you to see how you compare with the more experienced investor or the beginning investor. Where do you fit in and what should your goals be? See you in just a moment.
If you're unsure what to do next in our changing property markets, why not turn to the proven and trusted team at Metropole Property Strategists to take advantage of their expertise of profitably investing through the last five property cycles. The team at Metropole have been involved in over $3 billion worth of property transactions, creating wealth for their clients, and they can do the same for you. They don't sell property, so their advice is independent and unbiased. Metropole can devise a strategy, their buyer's agents will buy your property for you, or you could use their renovations team, property development, or portfolio management services. Arrange a time for an obligation-free chat at metropole.com.au. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In today's mentorship session, I want to remind you that change begins with choice, your choice. Each week I like to share a mentorship lesson with you because you have to recognize that to get different results, you've got to become a different person. To get to the next level, you've got to do different things that got you to this level. Otherwise, you'd already be there. And I often quote one of my early mentors, Jim Rohn. And Jim said, any day we wish, we can discipline ourselves to change it all. Any day we wish, we can open the book that will open the mind to new knowledge. Any day we wish, we can start a new activity. Any day we wish, we can start a process of life change. And we can do it immediately or next week or next month or next year. And Jim Rowan went on to say, we can also do nothing. We can pretend rather than perform. And if the idea of having to change ourselves makes us uncomfortable, we can remain as we are. We can choose to rest over labour entertainment over education, delusion over truth, and doubt over confidence. The choices are ours to make. But while we curse the effect, we continue to nourish the cause. Jim Rowan cleverly went on to say, as Shakespeare uniquely observed, the fault is not in the stars, but in ourselves. We create our circumstances by our past choices. We've both the ability and the responsibility to make better choices, beginning today. Those who are in search of the good life do not need more time or more answers to think things over to reach better conclusions. They need the truth. They need the whole truth. They need nothing but the truth, said Jim Rohn. We can allow ourselves errors in judgment repeated every day to lead us down the wrong path. We must keep coming back to those basics that make the biggest difference in how our life works out. And then we must make the very choices that will bring life, happiness, and joy into our daily lives. And Jim Rohn concluded, and if I may also be so bold to offer my last piece of advice for somebody seeking and needing to make changes in their life, if you don't like how things are, change it. You're not a tree. You've got the ability to totally transform every area of your life, and it all begins with your own power of choice. Now that's a great message. Change begins with choice. You've got a choice. What are you going to do now that you understand this? Have you ever wondered what the property goals of the average investor is in Australia? Are they conservative? Are they ambitious? And have you ever wondered how you compare? Well, at Metropole, we see many, many clients on a weekly basis and for we've been helping clients uh, for close to 20 years now grow, protect and pass on their wealth. Today, we're going to peek behind the curtains and get the two most common sets of property goals that we hear beginning investors and the more sophisticated, experienced investors uh, ask for. And to help me discuss this, I've got with me Ahmed Imam, Director of Metropole Properties in Sydney, Hi, Ahmed. Hi, Michael. Pleasure to be here. Well, in fact, I said I got you with me. You're on the other side of the uh, internet in Sydney and I'm in Melbourne, but you sit in front of clients all the time. You've been advising clients for a long time. Do you see a common theme? Do you see a common end game that they want? It's, it's actually quite interesting when you see as many clients as, as I do, as, as, as we do. You do certainly see some trends. Um, an open question that I always ask my clients during the initial strategy sessions I have is, what is your end game? You know, it's a very important question. 
Um, and the reason being is that I want to understand the client's long-term goals, their their risk profile, whether they're being conservative or ambitious, whether their goals are realistic um, based on their time frame and financial circumstances, and of course whether I whether or not I can assist. You know, so the, the end game for most, if not all, clients is financial independence. I mean, I mean that's what they're seeing me for. Okay, so what's the most common? end goal of financial independence they want. I know you ask how much do you want your cash machine to give you each year. What do they say? The most common I hear by far is, for for beginning investors that is, a a property portfolio that generates $100,000 in passive income per year. Now, that's interesting, Armand, because I agree with you and we see that here too. But interestingly, that doesn't seem to have changed over the years and $100,000 today really isn't going to get you very far, is it? No, it's not going to get you far, and it completely depends on a number of different variables. I mean, are you are you mortgage free? Do you still have your mortgage? Um, what are your living expenses? Do you have um, outlandish spending habits? So there are a number of variables there. I think it's important to recognise that today people are living longer and they're living those golden years in a different way. Many want to travel, whether it's locally, whether it's overseas, and many are still having to support their children and grandchildren. So I know when we sit down to help them plan their future, we're actually helping them not just for themselves, but a lot of them want to pass on their wealth to uh, a number of generations. So I think when we sit down, we actually want to help them so that their grandchildren can be dancing and (laughs) spending their money. So is $100,000 enough? Um, well, I mean, how long is a piece of string? Um, you know, note that the, the worst case scenario for any Australian is that they end up on a pension upon retirement, you know, and the pension equates to about $21,000 per year for individuals or about 32000 per year for couples living together. It's certainly not enough for financial independence, let alone the day-to-day expenses, um, you know, and, and it'll only ever allow you to live a very basic lifestyle. So, if there is even going to be a pension down the track, the government's not going to be able to afford all the baby boomers retiring because the majority of them haven't catered for their retirement well enough, but they're going to live longer and they're going to need the healthcare system more. So somebody's going to have to pay a lot more taxes. Yeah, that's right. We may not even have the pension at that stage, which which makes this even, even that much more important. Um, but I think it's fair to say the average, let's call it mortgage-free Australian couple needs around 40 to 50K per year upon retirement to live. Um, and, and notice I said to live, Michael. You know, that's, it's not living comfortably or living with luxuries. You know, you may be earning slightly more than, than pension, but you'd still be living a very modest lifestyle with, with low-cost activities. So t- to answer your question, is, is 100K enough? Um, well, yes, it is if you're a mortgage-free couple with generally conservative spending habits and, and lifestyle you know, then 100K will allow you to, let's say, cover your day-to-day expenses and and perhaps some small luxuries thrown in, such as travelling once or twice a year. Now, of course, it's 100000 in today's dollar value, which in 10, 20, 30 years' time would be a lot more because that won't buy you much then, will it? No, it, it won't at all. I mean, we have to account for inflation, but it's also important to determine if your goal is 100K gross or 100K net, you know, because they're very different goals and, and accordingly require much different asset-based targets. Okay. So one group of uh, requests uh, or or aims that beginning investors have is $100,000. Not that they even know how they're going to get that because it's not as easy to achieve as most of them think. Uh, What other common things do they ask for? The, The second most common thing I hear from beginning investors is usually a goal that is somewhere along the lines of, four to five investment properties by retirement age or financial independence age, um, which, is, which is always an interesting one. Why do you say that? Well, I mean, if, if I'm being direct, um, and you probably know exactly what I'm going to say, Michael, um, I, I never agree with a property goal that's tied to owning a certain number of properties. You know, it's, it's important to note that the number of properties you own does not determine your wealth, it does not determine your net worth, and so it's actually quite irrelevant. I mean, what is important is the size and value of your asset base and the quality of assets within your portfolio. You know, I, I could I could tell you that I've got 10 properties that are worth $100,000 each or 10 properties that are worth a million dollars each. You know, they're two very different propositions that yield very different results. 
So it's not really how many properties you've got. As I often say, I'd rather own one Westfield shopping centre than 50 regional properties. So you really have to understand how big your asset base is and how much income it's going to produce, uh, which is a much more relevant goal. And I think that's what we try and encourage our clients, that asset base first, grow your assets, and then eventually you'll get the cash flow. So that's what many of the beginning investors come and see you at Metropole request. What about the more experienced? What about the more sophisticated investor? Yeah, sure. Um, sophisticated and, and experienced investors are usually a, a little more ambitious than, than a beginning investor. Um, and note that over time, beginning investors do become experienced investors anyway. Yeah, the most common uh, goal I hear from experienced investors is is a property portfolio that generates closer to $200,000 in passive income per year. So a while ago, we said 100000 isn't enough income. What about 200000 is, is Is that a comfortable passive income in your mind, Armin? Yeah, look, yes and no. And, and the reason I say that, Michael, is when calculating the passive income you need upon your retirement, you shouldn't be comparing yourself to others, but be looking at your own current income and, and lifestyle, you know, because how much passive income you need to live comfortably is actually only relative to your existing lifestyle and your spending habits. You know, if, if you're currently earning an income of 400000 plus and you've been living an extravagant lifestyle, then no, you know, 200000 is not enough for you. But my suggestion is when determining your passive income goal, you should be attempting to supplement your existing income and then probably aim a little bit higher if uh, if time and finance allows, of course. So we said a while ago that the more inexperienced investors looking to grow a portfolio of four or five properties, what does the more sophisticated investor aim to end up with? The more sophisticated investor looks at more sophisticated strategies. Um, and there's no doubt the two most sophisticated strategies at the upper end are uh, developments, as in a development project of, let's say, a, a side-by-side townhouse, a, a duplex, or purchasing a block of units, let, let's say a block of four units or a block of six units, and and you know proceeding with a, a large-scale renovation. Interestingly, it's got to do a bit with their ambitions and their goals and their aims. So we see this come through in when I have the regular mindset messages in my podcast as well, that you've got to think big. And if you think like the average investor, you're going to end up with the same results as them. And in general, that's not going to get you as far in life. And I know that's one of the reasons that when we sit down with clients, we actually put a strategic property plan together with them and some scenarios. And we build it specifically for them and their goals and their timeframes and their income, because It's nice to have that intention, that aim of having four or five properties or having a block of apartments or doing a development, but are you going to be heading in the right direction? Are you going to achieve your goals in time? And so I know that's one of the things you and your team do, putting that together to actually look impartially and see, is it realistic? Yes, certainly. There's there's an entire macro strategy there, but it has to be tailored to you, your time frame, your goals. And, and property goals aren't as simple and, and clear cut as they appear to be. I mean, there's a number of different variables and we discuss some of them, um, you know, like your income, your joint incomes, your time frame, your serviceability, spending habits, lifestyle, risk profile, future plans. They're all things that have to be considered. So uh, you'll definitely get some benefit in, in sitting down with someone that has a perspective to talk to you about those things. And not somebody who's there to sell you property either, because that planning has to come beforehand, whether you buy your own home first, whether you buy an investment, how your current portfolio is going. So if people want to understand more about that service, I know they can get to you by going to metropole.com.au and making an inquiry and finding out a little bit more. Thank you so much for your time, Armin. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you. Well, that's almost it for another show, but I want to tell you about something I just recently found out about. On all podcast players, and in particular on the iPhone, uh, there's uh, a share button. On the iPhone, there are three little dots at the bottom. You press those and it'll allow you to share the episode in all sorts of ways. So if you got some benefit from this today, why don't you share it on Facebook, Twitter? Just like I like sharing my ideas with you, just like I'd like to bring more people into a level of financial fluency and to get through the difficult financial times and property market we've got, why don't you pay it forward as well by passing the message on to a friend? And it's really easy to do, and you can do it right now. Just 
whichever device you're on. I'd also like to share with you a review that was left for me. Uh, that one of them this week, and we keep getting a few every week, I really appreciate it, was Polls123, who said, very informative and engaging content. Thanks for doing these. I look forward to your comments, especially in the current tougher investing climate. Yes, the market is tougher, and I'm going to keep sharing with you our thoughts, our research, our ideas each week. But thank you for leaving that comment. Every week, when I read out a comment, if it's yours and you email me at michael at metropole.com.au with your contact details, I'll gift you a book of your choice. Just tell me which of my books you'd like. Now, I look forward to being back with you again this time next week when I'll help you learn a little bit more about property investment, success and money. Thanks for listening to this week's episode of the Michael Yardney podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect and pass on their wealth through strategic property advice. If you got value from today's show, we'd really appreciate it if you would leave a review and we'll read it out on a future show and Michael will gift you one of his books as a way of saying thank you. Just go to michaelyardneypodcast.com forward slash review and let us know what you think. If you don't already subscribe, head over to iTunes or your favorite Android app. You'll find us there as Michael Yardney Podcast. If you'd like to gain instant access to the show notes, head across to michaelyardneypodcast.com. Watch out for our show next week. You'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes.